This video is brought to you by Raycon. Hello, Wisecrack. Helen here, beaming to you from the comforts of my apartment. A lot of people talk about being productive during quarantine. Writing books, making short films, reading all the classics, inventing calculus. But I have them all beat. Because during this time, I have immersed myself in the greatest cultural catalog of them all, Netflix. I have studied everything this great purveyor of entertainment has put out. But there's one show I was most excited to sit on my couch and kill half a day watching. Space Force. The show seemingly had everything going for it. Its creator Greg Daniels had already made not one, but two modern TV classics. Plus, it featured an amazing cast. Steve Carell, John Malkovich, Jane Lynch, Fred Willard, Lisa Kudrow, Ben Schwartz, and Patrick Warburton, paired with a ridiculous premise. I was so hopeful. And then, this. Just a dog pile of bad press. And I don't think it was just reviewers being out of touch. This show is, in my very scientific and not at all arbitrary opinion, bad. Not exactly bright bad, but still a colossal disappointment. I let you down. It left me wondering, how could so many talented people produce such a misfire? How did a tried and true formula go so wrong? Let's find out in this Wisecrack edition on Space Force. What went wrong? But before we get into it, I want to give a shout out to Raycon. If you're thinking about jumping on the Bluetooth bandwagon, now's the time to take the leap. One of the greatest hesitations for me was earbud design. I don't like the hard shell earbuds because they always fall out of my ears so easily. But Raycon earbuds come with different size gel tips so you can get the most comfortable fit for your ear. They're snug, compact, and pretty discreet. On top of a great fit, they're more affordable coming in at about half the price of other premium wireless brands on the market, and you don't have to compromise on quality because they sound amazing. Raycon earbuds are perfect for working from home, working out, or just doing chores around the house when you need to listen to music or podcasts for hours. The Everyday E25 is their best model yet, with six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass, and a compact design that gives you a nice, noise-isolating fit. Check them out now by going to buyraycon.com slash wisecrack or by clicking the link in the description. When you use the link in the description, you'll get 15% off your order. Now, back to the show. First, a quick recap of the series. The TV series presents a fictionalized account of the US military's newest branch, the Space Force, as it tries to get boots on the moon by 2024. Steve Carell stars as General Mark Naird, a hard-nosed general appointed to lead it. Naird constantly has to balance the demands of his chest-thumping White House superiors with those of his scientific team, led by Adrian Mallory, who questions if it's logically or even ethically possible to get back to the moon on such a tight time frame, making matters even worse, Naird's family life is quickly spiraling out of control. His wife is in prison, and his teenage daughter resents him for being a workaholic. Faced with both professional and personal uncertainty, there's only one place where Naird can find relief. Marco, Montego, baby, why don't we go? Oh, I love it, man. Wish that potato bean girls don't cry. Space Force, at its heart, gives us two TV shows in one half-hour-ish package. First, a wacky office sitcom a la The Office and Parks and Rec, and second, a political satire in the vein of Veep. But by constantly straddling this line, Space Force doesn't quite succeed as either. So let's break down how it fails on both counts. Part 1. The Workplace Sitcom since the advent of television, the workplace sitcom has provided an easy-to-shoot setting for a group of eccentrics to gather round and crack wise. From McHale's Navy, to Taxi, to Cheers, to Ally McBeal, to Archer, the workplace has served as a backdrop for various characters to both come together and clash, their personality differences providing conflict for each episode. Because these corporate bag munchers only $630 for my goddamn flex account! In Comedy, A Geographic and Historical Guide, scholar Maurice Charney uses Cheers as the prototypical example of the workplace sitcom. He writes, It is the most ritualized sitcom format, as it relies on the repetition of a setting, of each character's traits, and of each set of conflicts and alliances. It presented a set of highly ritualized characters whose personality traits were extremely fixed and who interacted with one another in the same ways each week. Each episode of Cheers is structured pretty much exactly the same, revolving around bartender Sam Malone as he tends bar and deals with patrons and employees. The workplace, aka the bar, became idealized. 
Not necessarily because of the job itself, but because no matter the problem, each character could always rely on the people there to have their backs. Sam was always willing to lend an ear to Coach, Diane, Carla, Cliff, Norm, and Fraser. Just take it from the Cheers theme song. Sometimes you wanna go where everybody knows your name. The same was true of other workplace comedies of the era and of those that preceded Cheers. On Ally McBeal, it was the law firm. On Taxi, the garage dispatch center. However, as television aged, the depiction of the workplace on sitcoms became far darker. Take Greg Daniels' breakout adaptation of The Office. The workplace became an existential prison, and the shared experiences characters bonded over, when they bonded, were centered around their incompetent and incredibly offensive boss. Dunder Mifflin is a complete dead end for each character. Jim, the everyman hero of the series, hates his job, openly stating that, Well, if this were my career, I'd have to throw myself in front of a train. Aside from the occasional light of an office romance, Dunder Mifflin is marked by soul-crushing monotony. This here is a run-out-the-clock situation, just like upstairs. In season two's The Office Olympics, we see how each employee copes with their pointless jobs, crafting elaborate games for themselves just to pass the time. And Dunder Mifflin, unlike the bar of Cheers, doesn't seem to bring these eccentrics together. It divides them. Boy, have you lost your mind, cause no, no, no. I'll help you find it. While they eventually about face later in the show, much of the early seasons of The Office deal with the antagonistic relationship between coworkers. For instance, in season one's The Alliance, after rumors of downsizing begin to spread, people at The Office begin to form secret packs against one another. There's no downsizing. I, but if there were, I'd be protected as assistant regional manager. Later in the series, when the employees dare to even think about joining together and unionizing, the Dunder Mifflin higher-ups squash the camaraderie, threatening to dissolve the branch completely. If there is even a whiff of unionizing in this branch, I can guarantee you the branch will be shut down like that. Dunder Mifflin is repeatedly shown to be a toxic environment, one in which stupidity and boorishness are promoted. Look no further than Jim's boss, Michael Scott, who has proven time and time again to be an impediment to productivity. Michael claims to have his employees' best interests at heart, yet whenever he feels challenged, he immediately sells them out. The guys downstairs are thinking about forming a union, and they have some what? good points. A union? Don't if you've ever wondered why he hates Toby so much, it's likely because he's the only person who can challenge his antics. Miami, mean, you still can't make fun of people for race or gender or sexual orientation or religion. Who let, who let the lemon head? into the room. Or consider the time when Jim takes a private meeting with the CFO, and Michael mistakenly thinks this means Jim must be angling for his job. To ensure he doesn't get fired, Michael badmouths Jim to his higher-ups, thereby sabotaging Jim's promotion. Constant office distraction, spends way too much time at reception, antagonizes other salesmen, not at all what he thinks he is. How bad is Dunder Mifflin? It's so bad that employment lawyer Julie Elgar even started a blog chronicling all the actionable offenses that occur at the company. And it's over 30 pages long. In its later years, the office softened some of these edges. Many characters ended up marrying their co-workers or forming unlikely friendships with one another. Yet Dunder Mifflin itself always remained a destructive environment. In The Office's finale, it's telling that, for a vast majority of the characters, their happy ending involves getting away from this corporate hellmouth. Not quite as cheerful as, well, cheers, but also not quite as nightmarish as The Office, Space Force's workplace setting exists somewhere between the two visions. On one hand, the Space Force base is located in the desolate wasteland of Colorado, a place where the only sign of life is a single convenience store patroned by meth gangs. It's so bad that when Naird first tells his wife where they're moving, she immediately breaks down in tears. Colorado, like Dunder Mifflin, is depicted as a dead end for Naird and his family. When the series jumps ahead a year in the opening episode, Naird's wife is now literally behind bars for unexplained reasons, and his daughter has no friends or job prospects to speak of. Naird himself feels trapped. His momentous promotion to a four-star general is quickly undercut as he becomes the four-star general of a branch considered a joke amongst his peers. Well, it's not bullcrap for Space Force. First time with your keister in the hot seat. Might be your last. <laughs> <laughs> and yet the Space Force base stands in strong contrast to these immediate surroundings. Hidden behind a rocky mountain, the base is a luxurious, high-end campus. Spacious, green, and pristine. Heck, they even have an ice cream stand. So is Naird stuck in a dead-end job, or is this the opportunity of a lifetime? 
Well, Space Force can't really decide one way or the other. Sometimes the series is very critical of Nerd's job and his attempts to militarize space. After Space Force's satellite is cut apart by a rival Chinese satellite, Nerd proposes that they use a bomb to push the broken pieces back together. What about a bomb? In my experience with the Air Force, that was very often the right answer. Very, very often. Of course, Mallory shoots the idea down, because a bomb won't work in the vacuum of space. Huh. All right, a big f***ing bomb. That was my first instinct anyway. That's no better. Shockwaves. It's a vacuum. Space is a vacuum. Thus, the idea of implementing traditional military techniques is depicted not only as wrong, but as completely absurd. In The Office, Daniels really explored what it meant to be in a dying, pointless industry. A place where your average employee can only ask the basic question, why? And it seems like a similar opportunity with Space Force. Whereas The Office explored the waning paper industry, Space Force explores the reigning of American hegemony. Hey, Nerd. Hmm. Can you help getting back at the Chinese for what they did to your satellite? A little ground and pound? Whatever. I don't know. Let me know. Marines at your disposal. And even if the Space Force itself isn't obsolete, it certainly seems frivolous to many. The show takes some strides in this direction, basically reducing the conflict between China and the US as a childish pissing contest, mostly involving vandalism. But the series pretty quickly backs off. The US actually is in a military standoff with the Chinese for space dominance. Daniels even stated that the more he researched Space Force, the more sense the department actually made. The more research that we did into it, the more it didn't feel like the problem was all in the heads of people in the United States. Because there's people in Russia and China and elsewhere scrambling to get up there. Unlike Dunder Mifflin, where the job was in and of itself completely pointless, working at the Space Force is treated as an integral and worthwhile vocation. So the series is stuck in a strange middle ground, both highly critical of the militarization of space, yet also treating it like a necessity, which inherently makes satire more difficult. To be fair, this middle ground was masterfully tread in Parks and Rec, a show that skewered dysfunctional local politics. I think the slogan should be Pawnee, home of crackers, the orangest goldfish in Indiana. While ultimately championing local politician Leslie for her perseverance. But the viewpoint of the show, unlike Space Force, was clear. The democratic process is messy, overly bureaucratic, and dominated by rich idiots. But we can still try to turn a giant pit into a park. It just might take a few years. We present the crown jewel of Pawnee. Even more, Space Force is missing a key ingredient that made The Office, Parks and Rec, Cheers, and pretty much every sitcom ever made work. The straight man or woman. On Cheers, it was bartender Sam Malone. For The Office, Jim Halpert. For Parks and Rec, Mark and Anne. These characters served as audience surrogates for the series, the every man or woman reacting to the crazy hijinks that happen around them. On The Office, Dwight, Michael, and Angela could be as insane and off-color as needed, but then you could always count on the camera panning over to Jim, shaking his head in amusement. However, with Space Force, there really isn't a traditional straight man. Nerd is technically our entryway into the show, the point of view character. Yet Space Force constantly distances us from him by depicting him as a blustering idiot. It's Nerd that tries to use a monkey to fix a broken satellite and later accuses one of his scientists of being a Chinese spy based solely on his race. Chan, definitely. But Chan is my number two. I consider him above suspicion. All right, so we've got Yuri Baxter Chan. In these instances, the series cuts to Malkovich's Adrian Mallory as he shakes his head in amusement. So is Mallory the everyman? Not quite. While he balances Nerd, he oozes pretension. Mallory's even more eccentric than Nerd, a self-centered hothead, set off by anyone who doesn't take him seriously. Without a straight man or woman, the characters on Space Force constantly veer between oscillating extremes. Sometimes Nerd is upheld as a beacon of virtue, someone the audience should sympathize with and relate to. The founder of the Space Force, that's going to be me. While other times, he does this. You're overheating. <laughs> Sweat! This weakness leaving the body! Ironically, this is a problem Greg Daniels has dealt with before on Parks and Rec. Sure, Mark and Anne offered balance to Leslie's antics, but they weren't quite central to the show. Just take it from Daniels himself. But Parks and Rec didn't really hit until season two. The big adjustment was that Amy Poehler was funnier being the smart center of a crazy world than somebody whose character flaws caused their own problems. I would say by three or four episodes, we had fixed that, I think, personally. 
It wasn't until Parks and Rec created a straight woman out of Amy Poehler's Leslie Nope that the show was able to find its footing. And even when she got a little too into binders and waffles, she was grounded with the down-to-earthness of someone like Anne. However, Space Force still hasn't found that balance yet. But this balance is only half the story, because besides being a workplace comedy, Space Force is also trying to be a political satire. Part 2. Political Satire Just as Space Force is wishy-washy about its depiction of workplace antics, it's also wishy-washy about its satire. According to Daniels, Space Force is supposed to be a commentary on how the idealism of space has been co-opted by militaristic nationalism. What was once about the idealistic pursuit of human exploration One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind has instead become all about national and military dominance. According to Daniels, I think the show's feeling is more that it's too bad we're now in this new phase of space exploration, where it isn't about doing it for all mankind. In some moments, Space Force really nails the satirical point. We need to hit back hard. We can bomb. Big bomb, little bomb, smart bomb, <laughs> stupid bomb. There's one for every occasion. Yet, at the same time, Space Force constantly pulls its punches. On a biting satire like Veep, the show takes no prisoners. Every subject, every political movement is open to ridicule, whether liberal or conservative. Rather than attacking a political faction, the show puts the entire political process on blast. People need to think he's in here, leading. But he's not. He is, according to the rumor I put out. Space Force, on the other hand, wants to be a satire of America's militaristic nationalism without letting itself be too mean to the institution at the center of it. As such, Space Force lacks any specific perspective. Militarizing space is both absurd and a necessity. General Naird is both a great man and a total buffoon. The job is both noble and a dead end. Space Force wants to have it every which way, and in the process, it says nothing at all. Just look at how the series treats its central antagonistic relationship, Mark Naird versus Adrian Mallory. In many ways, this relationship is a mirror image of our favorite local government odd couple. In Parks and Rec, the central antagonistic relationship was between Leslie Nope and Ron Swanson. Leslie represented the textbook liberal. She earnestly believed that through public service, she could help fix the wrongs of the world and build a better tomorrow. When we worked here together, we fought, scratched, and clawed to make people's lives a tiny bit better. That's what public service is all about. However, Leslie's boss, Ron, represented the textbook libertarian. He believed the government should be virtually non-existent. My idea of a perfect government is one guy who sits in a small room at a desk, and the only thing he's allowed to decide is who to nuke. As such, Ron supported minimizing the Parks and Rec Department's output by hiring people who would do as little as possible. But I like Tom. He doesn't do a lot of work around here. He shows zero initiative. He's not a team player. He's never one to go that extra mile. Tom is exactly what I'm looking for in a government employee. Now, naturally, you would expect Leslie and Ron to butt heads. And yes, oftentimes they did. Mm, 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 me want more pointless social programs. Yummy, yummy, yum. But as the series grew, the show focused less on the antagonism between the two and more on their unlikely friendship. Despite their political differences, Ron and Leslie genuinely cared for one another and helped each other both professionally and personally. As such, Parks and Rec used Ron and Leslie's relationship to present an idealized form of government, one in which people from opposing party lines could still come together to get things done. Just take it from Amy Poehler. The show is about the fact that there's a lot of people who work together who have nothing in common except for the fact that they work together. That really describes, to me, national politics. People who have nothing in common except for the fact that they work together and have to find a way to work together and make change happen. Similarly, on Space Force, Naird and Mallory represent opposite ends of the ideological spectrum. Mallory embodies a kind of smug liberal intelligentsia, whereas Naird is your ignorant and blustery military man. I am what used to be known in America as a man. But unlike Parks and Rec, Space Force doesn't use this contrasting relationship to comment on any larger issues. Instead, it's just kind of all over the place. Sometimes Mallory is used as an obstacle for Naird to overcome. For instance, in the pilot, Mallory keeps trying 
trying to underhandedly postpone Nerd's satellite launch, stating the scientific dangers of doing so prematurely. But by the end of the episode, Nerd follows his gut and successfully launches the satellite, proving Mallory's objections to be unfounded. However, in later episodes, Nerd's gut military instincts are a liability, and it's Mallory's cautious reasoning that saves the day. In Episode 5, Nerd is only able to defeat the rival Air Force's team in a test skirmish because of Mallory's Deus Ex Machina code. Space Force seems unsure of what side it's on, Mallory's intellectualism or Nerd's jingoism. It basically becomes a toss-up each episode on who will be proven right, as if since Nerd won the day last episode, now it's Mallory's turn to do so. And if the ultimate point is that both men end up rubbing off on one another, creating a new middle ground? Well, Space Force doesn't present that traditional arc either. Instead, by the final episodes, both men suddenly shift perspectives out of the blue. After Space Force discovers that the Chinese have established a base on the moon, it's Mallory who thinks they need to take a more decisive, militaristic approach. What if your friend who runs the Navy were to move a carrier strike group, or no, two carrier strike groups into the South China Sea. Whereas Nerd wants to try a more diplomatic route and speak to the Chinese general. Sometimes it's important that cooler heads prevail. Thus, the characters don't even attempt to come to a middle ground. They simply switch ideologies based on, well, plot. The closest Space Force comes to making a clear political point happens in the last episode. After Nerd is ordered by his White House superiors to burn the Chinese moon base to the ground, he enlists Mallory to help defy this order. Nerd then gives the following speech. Forget how bad polio was. People stop taking vaccines. Forget how bad world wars are. People start puffing out their chests. The real enemy is arrogance. This seems to be the ultimate point of Space Force, that both Mallory and Nerd's arrogance often blind them to the correct course of action. If only both characters and the world at large could put their egos aside, then the real work could be done. And yet nothing in the previous nine episodes shows this point to be true, because it's Nerd's arrogance in the pilot, that his gut knows better than science, that saves the day. And it's Mallory's perceived intellectual superiority that allows the Space Force to defeat the Air Force in their skirmish. All Space Force has proven up to now is that Nerd and Mallory should be staunch in their beliefs in case they're accidentally right. Ultimately, Space Force twists itself so much to appease every side that it forgets to say anything interesting or really anything much at all. However, it's not all doom and gloom. The first seasons of The Office and Parks and Rec were similarly fraught with issues before reversing course to become two of the most beloved modern sitcoms. So if anyone can write this ship, especially with such a great cast, it's Greg Daniels. But what do you think? Are we just cranky because Space Force hasn't lived up to the greatness of its predecessors, or is it legitimately bad? Let us know what you think in the comments. Big, big thanks to our awesome patrons for supporting our channel and podcasts, and as always, thanks for watching. Peace.